Endless Endeavor podcast, episode number eight, with myself, Greg Anderson. And today's guest is a good friend of mine, Chad Youngquist. Uh, we became friends several years ago through just some mutual friends and uh, some other members of his family that I've grown close with over the years. And Chad has some very interesting perspectives and some things in his life that uh, a lot of people may not be facing personally, but I think that everybody is in some aspect is going to be exposed to the, the type of challenges that he's facing as a father and as a husband. And I decided to be a good topic for a podcast to sit down because what today's episode is going to be based on is parenting when you have a special needs child. So in regards to what those special needs are and, and what he's facing and, and what type of disabilities he's facing, I think it'd be better to just let you have a kind of a open platform let people know what what it is that you're dealing with. And uh, it's a topic that I'm very unfamiliar with, so I'm sure I'm going to have a million questions trying to understand where you're coming from and, and what the disability entails and, and kind of educate myself on everything about what I'm about to, to learn. So if you go ahead and just kind of introduce yourself, let us know a little bit about your background, and we'll just take it from there. Oh, you bet. Well, first, thanks for having me. This is fun. Um, so my wife, Jamie, and I, we have two kids. Macy is 14, going to be 15 this year. Uh, and Max, our son, is 12, about to turn 13. Max was diagnosed uh, with autism uh, at, I think, uh, right about five years old. Um, but that wasn't the start of our, uh, our process. We knew right from day one uh, that, he, that there was something different about him and that it was going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and because we just had, I don't know if it was sort of parental intuition or, or what it was, but some things happened in the birthing room that kind of made us pause a little bit. One was uh, he came out just gray as a ghost and it startled me a little bit. And turns out that that happens occasionally and it's not something to worry about, but it was like kind of that thing that, kicked your mind into gear like what's going on here mm -hmm. and the other thing that caught us off guard was um labor and delivery and everything from the point we got in the car to leave for the hospital to the point where i was holding him was 45 minutes oh wow it happened so fast they were treating jamie like a like a triage patient when we were running into the hospital the um, she was throwing up and all this, it was just crazy and started, I mean, she was having Max bef like as they're wheeling her into a birthing room. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when he came out, he didn't make a peep. All that crazy, just, okay, I want out uh -huh. and, uh, laid him down on Jamie's chest and, and, uh, dude didn't make a sound. So without him making any noise and with him looking gray, were, were you, obviously you're concerned as a parent because this is all new to you and someone in that situation, but what was the medical staff and the doctors? How were they treating that? Did they seem alarmed? Nobody said a word. And so I was looking around going, is anyone else seeing this? Is this okay? And nobody was alarmed. So I went, okay, then this must be fine. Mm -hmm. um, but and he appeared to be breathing or? Yeah, he was breathing. It okay. was fine. And so... Um, and I guess part of it too, might've been my brother, uh, lost his first child, uh, mm -hmm. in, in the birthing room. And, uh, and so uh, the, she ended up living for a little bit longer, uh, four or five more days, but, um, like that is on the back of your mind. Yeah. Now, anytime you, your wife goes into the birthing room, you, you, that's in the back of your mind. And so when he came out gray, it startled me. So I was watching very closely and no, none of the nurses were alarmed. And, and, uh, uh, but the, the peculiar thing was they cleaned him off, you know, put him in a, you know, I cut the umbilical cord and they kind of wipe him down and just lay him on Jamie for a second. And every kid, I mean, that's a pretty radical environment change, right? Yeah. Going yeah. from the womb to, a 68 degree hospital room uh -huh. and uh, a, a, almost every baby cries and it's like it's 
wow, I'm breathing air now, like the whole thing. It's just a radical life change for a human to go through. And he didn't make a noise. He just, eh, it's cool. Laid down and, and, uh, and the sound just, oh, I'm sorry. No, um, no, I heard that too. Technic um, technical diff difficulty. Yeah. It's all good. And later that evening, uh, as the dust settled and the nurses were gone, um, I kind of looked at Jamie and I just basically said, how are you feeling about this whole thing? And, and, uh, she's like, that, that was different. Um, yeah, it was just something about it. It's different. Yeah. Cause we, you know, we had had our daughter two years prior and, um, it was a way different experience. And so, so when you say, I mean, obviously there was things that were concerning and things that kind of just made that little thing in the back of your mind go, what's, what's going on here? But did you, did you think that something was potentially wrong or just different? I thought it was different. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I mean, if nobody, if, if the alarms aren't going off and with the nurses and doctors, then, then I, I was okay. Yeah. But I, I just felt like something was different. And the, because he was two weeks early, the conversation, we, we didn't have a name for him yet. And so the conversation the next morning after we got some sleep, like, hey, what are we going to name the kid? <laughs> and, uh, and we yeah, had some. one of those things. Yeah. A name. Right. And we had uh, a couple of favorite names, you know, for boys picked out. And uh, Jamie was like, uh, I don't think we should name him those names. This is something about him's different. I feel like he's going to live life to the max. So. I think oh, his, wow. I think his name is Max. And I said, well, you mean like maximum danger? <laughs> and uh, she said, no, like Maxwell or something like that. So his name is Maxwell. Um, and because of that moment in the hospital and the kind of that little alarm in the back of your head that thinks something might be different, mm -hmm. we paid very close attention to him uh, early on. And paid very close attention to the milestones that every child's supposed to make. And when he wasn't making any of them, uh, we began to just seek out, uh, medical attention. Okay. Bit. And so, so at five, he was diagnosed, but hindsight being 2020, you now know that this was something that he was born with. Yeah. By the time the autism diagnosis and sorry, I, I, um, we didn't say that it's, it is autism. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe should have said that at the beginning, but, uh, by the time he got a formal diagnosis, it was just that it was a formality at that point. Okay. He had already been in, I mean, he was seen specialists at children's hospital. He'd done a bunch of, um, biological testing, hearing tests, like kind of run the gamut of, um, it, you know, is he deaf? Is he not speaking? Cause he can't hear you. Um, you know, you kind of run through the things and, and autism got ruled out early on because this is, this is uh, well, let's see 10 years ago now. Mm -hmm. And um, this, the, the kind of the criteria for diagnosing autism, one of the things was not a lot of human contact and not a lot of eye contact. So not a lot of physical affection and meaning he, they don't seek it or they don't, they don't display it or it both. And they don't want it. Okay. Like they don't, they don't like human touch and, and don't seek it out. And so, um, and that, and the eye contact, he, he was, a, he's, he's always been a hugger and he's always, you know, maintained good eye contact. And so they ruled it out at the beginning and, and they leave you with this diagnosis that means absolutely nothing but it scares the crap out of you and it's called pervasive development disorder not otherwise specified mm -hmm. like that's a bunch of big words to tell me absolutely nothing and scare me because now i have no idea yeah and it gives on. you no tools and and no right. idea what you're dealing with and no resources mm -hmm. you you can't walk into a school uh and say hey this is what my child has um what kind of programs can we put together and so um, it wasn't until a couple of years later uh, where he started exhibiting more and more 
of the things that you normally see in autism. A lot of ticks, some mm-hmm. hand flapping and repetitive noises with his mouth. And he would, he wouldn't play with toys. He would line them up. That's, that's a pretty telltale sign. Uh huh. Um, so let me ask you this before we get into some of the challenges that you're facing. There's autism as a whole. Like, obviously I've heard, I've heard of it. I've heard about people being on the spectrum. You hear about autism awareness, but, and maybe it's just my own naivety, but just explain like what it encompasses and what it is and kind of just what, what you've come to understand encompasses somebody being on the spectrum and even what being on the spectrum mean. Cause I've heard that term and I don't even, I couldn't even necessarily put that into words. Yeah. This is a terribly hard question to answer because of the spectrum part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's a lot of volatility out there in the autism world on, you know, what is diagnosed, what should be diagnosed, why are, why are there so many being diagnosed today? Um, And, uh, you know, you go from on this spectrum, you've got savants and people with, uh, you know, photographic memories and the, the just ultra smart people. And on the other end of the spectrum with underneath the same umbrella of a diagnosis, you've got nonverbal, you've got, uh, kids that will, won't stop hurting themselves. And so when you say, what is autism? It's like, holy cow. I, I don't know how to answer that question. I always tell people, if you know one person with autism, you know precisely one person with autism. And that's it. It's not like that with Got other it. with other uh, issues, health issues going on with people where um, you can kind of you can kind of say, hey, this is this is what this group of people f- are faced with on a day to day and the challenges that present themselves in in their situation. Autism is radically different from person to person. And there are a lot of the same things. There's, you know, uh, social stuff is is a big one. Uh, just social cues and communication. Um, that sort of is a common denominator amongst the entire spectrum, at least, you know, most of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's, uh, like, stimming is, is, is short for self-stimulating behavior. Uh, and, and I've been told that it's uh, st- stimming is like the hand flapping and the repetitive and the pacing and the and the and the jumping up and down. And it, you'll see you'll see uh, people with autism do that quite a bit. And, uh, you know, f- and, and for Max, his tics or his stimming behaviors have changed throughout his life. And uh and he knows them now. He's 12 years old, almost 13. He knows, like, hey, I'm going to go stim. And it's when he takes in uh, so much inbound stimulus that he needs to block, he needs to put up some blocks. And so he creates outbound stimulus to process the incoming stimulus. That's wow. the way I've been told. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and so, like, take sporting events. For example, Max loves to watch sports on TV, but he can only watch sports for about 10 minutes. And then he has to come here into this room, close the door and you can hear him in here. If he's watching football, he'll come in and he'll come in here. He'll watch 10 minutes of football and then he'll come in here for 30 minutes and act out an entire game. And he's the He's the announcer, he's the quarterback, he's the receiver, he's everybody. And he role plays the whole thing. And you can hear him in here. He closes the door because he gets really loud. Um, now, is he using his imagination to kind of create a game? Or is he 100%. reenacting what actually took place? Well, so one of the things, because of the stimulus part of it, he loves to, he knows every single quarterback in the NFL's cadence. He knows how their voice fluctuates. He knows what they say during their, before they snap the ball. And because they're yelling at the line, right? They're, they're, they're turning their head. 
they're sometimes they're they're doing foot signals they're doing hand signals they're they're tight they're, and they're most but most of the time they're yelling down the lines because it's loud in the stadium and and the 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 linemen can't hear them and so max will be watching a game and who cares what happened on the play he's like back that up back that up he'll stop and he'll rewind and he goes do you hear what he said it's like to anyone watching the game, it's like, who cares, man? He was just snapping the ball. He's uh-huh. like, maybe it was a busted play. Maybe it was a touchdown. It doesn't matter to Max. He wanted to, he wanted to hear that quarterback's yelling of the cadence. And so that stimulus, like he just thrives off listening to the quarterback go through his count to snap the ball. And he'll come in here, and most of what he does is – He'll, he'll go through those noises and those sounds and those grunts and the yelling of the numbers and the weird words that quarterbacks do. Um, and so stimming is, you know, that's one of them. The other thing, like he, when we go to the river to play in the boat, he, he'll we'll drop him off on shore and he'll stand in waist deep water and he'll, he'll run his hand in a circle and just watch the water waves and, Dude, we could leave him there for like three hours <laughs> if we wanted to. He just uh-huh. he loves it. And so, and he knows it. And he's like, there's a hand ringing that he does um, when he gets excited. And he, and, he, and he looks at me and he does the ring. Like, check it out. I'm stimming because I really enjoy this, whatever's going on right now. Oh, that's strange that he's like made that connection that I need to stimulate at this time for this reason and understands it's just part of his, I guess you'd say, learning process, huh? Yeah, I don't think he like understands the science behind it or, and yeah, all that yeah. stuff. But he, but he, he knows that when he gets excited, the stimming comes out. And and um, you know, one of the things that parents deal with early on is the stimming can be alarming, mm-hmm. and it can be awkward. You can be in the grocery store, and the the loud, repetitive noises with your voice, or the the clapping or the yelling, um, it, it can be awkward in public it can be uh it can actually be disheartening as a mom or dad because you don't know what's happening at first yeah and you're just going oh man something's wrong i don't know how to fix it when in reality much of the time these activities are going on the stimming is going on it's self-soothing and it's good yeah and so we've gotten to a point in, in our lives where um we know what's going to trigger it yeah. and we know it's how it's going to manifest itself and it's not that awkward and it's and and sometimes it can be but dude we've been at it for over a decade now we just frankly don't care yeah <laughs> yeah would you say i mean this we go off on a completely different tangent but just understanding and awareness and i mean the numbers are are rising mm-hmm. with autism yeah do you feel like more people are receptive to to when he does have an episode or you are in a position where it may have been embarrassing 10 years ago, but there just seems to be more of an understanding now? You know, that's interesting because in my adult world, I don't know. Because um, mm-hmm. I don't I don't pay too close attention to it. One thing I've noticed, like you, you're, you're super worried about your kid being weird at school and getting bullied, right? Of course. I mean, you and I are uh, older, and when we were in school, like, uh, you got picked on if you were doing anything weird. Yep. And uh, I guess the kid's a total rock star at school. Like, his sister and his cousins, they'll come home, and like, he's the most popular kid at school. That's cool. And, And you're like... You're you're stoked. I mean, you, one you go, you're worried because you're like, wait a minute, do they know he's autistic? And so they go overboard to treat him better. Um, I don't, you know, he shouldn't be getting a free pass just because of a diagnosis. And I'm, there's probably an element of that. Yeah, you know, you see a lot now, just videos on the internet going around of things like. Like, I don't know. You follow UFC, right? A little bit, yeah. So do you know who Diego Sanchez is? Not totally familiar. But okay, so he's an old school UFC fighter. Okay. And he took a cage fight with a guy with Down syndrome. Because that was his, it was, I guess that was this guy's dream to have a cage fight. I think I did see that. And actually. so yeah. you see things like that where 
Okay, obviously Diego Sanchez is not going to fight somebody with a disability. Right. That's not what's going on here. But at the same time, you can do something and show that person kindness and help them, you know, potentially live out something that's like a, a goal or a dream of theirs. But that doesn't take away from what they're doing either. Yeah. Meaning like if people are showing Max kindness or they are doing things for him because he has a disability or because they've seen him behave in an awkward manner or whatever, I wouldn't say that would detract from that kindness at all. Right. You know, like, yeah, dad's always worried about the boy getting a free pass. Yeah, I'm sure. But uh, I, I think there is a movement with like a lot of anti-bullying stuff where maybe for the first time in a long time, well, up until maybe six months ago, I feel like it was cool to be kind. Yeah, no, you know? there, there's a definitely a different flavor, I feel like, at school. Um, and just the reports that I get from his peers, because he's on an IEP, which is an individualized education plan. So we meet with a room full of educators when it t comes time for conference time. Uh -huh. So... Um, we hear, <clears throat> excuse me, we hear from multiple people and principals and security guards and everybody um, how he's doing. And it's surprising to me the culture in, in, at least in our school, in our little town here in central Washington, uh, that it's as good as it is. Because I don't feel like you and me going to school at that age and faced with the same difficulties that Max is faced with, that we would have gotten the same treatment. No, yeah, I highly doubt it. Yeah. No, it's weird to think about, and I talk about this a lot, just the contrast of what going to school like when we were kids versus what it is now, both positive and negative. It, it's just the, the contrast is dramatic. Yeah. You know, I feel like when we were going to school, just – being ridiculous and getting in fights and there was lots of bullying and it just seemed like that was kind of how things were back then. Yeah. And now like, I guess a fight in a school is a huge deal. And it's, right. Yeah, it right. seemed to be like, that was called Thursday when we, when we were going, <laughs> right. Up, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting too, cause Macy's two years older and when he, when Max hit middle school, that's, that's the, like, that's, there's the proof. Like, is this going to get completely sideways or is this going to go good? Like, you'll find that out in middle school. Mm -hmm, for sure. Elementary school was a, was a piece of cake. Like, you got kids that are, you know, everybody's on kind of the same page. And then when puberty kicks in and kids are getting a little bit older and they're kind of, you know, figuring out who they're going to be, that's when things get a little rowdy and, we were fortunate enough, his older sister, Macy, is a godsend in this family from day one. She's been probably the most instrumental person in his educational development mm -hmm. out of any teacher and any special educator, um, just with the work she's put in with him. So going into middle school, we caught it at the right moment. So we're six, seven, eighth grade in our middle school. She's in eighth grade as she's going into eighth as he's going into sixth. And so they're at the same school again. Got it. And so you've got, and cool, that, that's this, that was last year. And this was this last school year. Yeah. Okay. So you've got the, the cool, cute, uh, blonde girl, uh, in eighth grade, kind of top of the school, um, looking out for her brother. Um, and, and that I, undoubtedly plays a role in him having like just social acceptance because she, you know, if, if everybody, if she's one of the people that just gets along with everybody and is well known, then yeah, that's like kind of like that gives him street cred right away, you know? Right, exactly. And the other thing that did is it gave him the ability to not panic. Because you put Max in a situation that's difficult and the meter goes to the red almost immediately and he's out. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened with, with middle school is you're, you're changing classes six, seven times a day or whatever it is. And like that was our biggest fear. Like Max is going to get lost in the shuffle. He's going to literally get lost and then he's going to panic and he's going to have a meltdown in school. And, and, then, and then learning is like, off 
you know, you done. You can't, yeah, yeah. you can't do, you can't learn if, if Max is just seeing red. And one of the cool things that Macy was able to do is just go grab him, take him to his classes. Or just escort him around. Yeah. And just took the panic level uh, and the, and the worry about how I navigate my day or f- for Max. I just, just erase that. Cause Macy would literally be, she, it's like first week of class in the school year she was late to every single class <laughs> and she would just walk in and she, she would just tell the teacher, Hey, I had to go get my brother, make sure he made it to his next class. Sorry. I'm a few minutes late, but so she didn't get detention. No. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, she got a, she got a pass. Yeah, doing course. that. And, and, uh, um, she ended up changing her schedule to be a TA in his math class just so she could help the teacher. Cause it was a, you know, obviously a, uh, special ed math class and um, she was able to like help the kids and help the teacher and so she she acted as a TA for the teacher's assistant for that period and she had her schedule changed just so she could be a TA in one of Max's classes just so that like it was right in the middle of the day too so kind of hey how you doing check in uh, how was lunch um, everything going okay let me help you with some math. Uh huh. Yeah. And so, so you say you were afraid of him having a meltdown and to try and quantify that. I mean, would you say that that's something that he experiences at school more regularly or at home more regularly, or is there a split? No, it was, it's almost a hundred percent at home. Okay. Yeah, so, so leaving the house mm-hmm. and being stimulated by different things and learning seems to, kind of make the potential of meltdowns ebb a little bit yeah so what happens uh and and i think this happens with a lot of parents in in our situation and a lot of kids in max's situation is that they are able to hold it together just long enough to hear that final bell ring Uh uh-huh and then and when they get in the car or they get home to their comfort zone they just let it rip yeah. Like all this pent up anxiety and whatever it is, fear or too much stimulus or the fluorescent lights in the hallway might have been setting a kid off. We don't like there's so many sensory issues and so many different things, social issues, all this stuff. And what what we've found with Max, and I think this is the case for a lot of uh, families with autistic kids is is um, they can hold it together and once they find their safe place, it's time to let it out. Yeah. And that's when the meltdown happens. Like it was, it was most of the time because Jamie picked him up from school every single day in our own car, didn't ride the bus. And he was teeing off on her halfway between the school and the car. Like he's already yelling at her before they even got in the car. Well, and I would say that that's this, a very similar dynamic in most households autism or not yeah and like i don't know how it was with macy because every kid is different but my daughters they have their meltdowns and obviously they don't have they're not on the spectrum so it's it's very different but i would imagine that my daughters would be like hellions at school <laughs> right. because of how they are at the house i have a lot of arguments with them they fight a lot they're they're at each other's throats and, and then I go talk to the teachers at parent teacher conference and they're like, you have the sweetest children. They're so kind. They listen to every word. They never talk back. And I'll, I'll even say like, are we talking, yeah. like, do I need to pull up a picture of my kid and make <laughs> right. sure we're talking about the same one. And exactly. it's the same thing when they get home, it's time to compress. It's time to let or decompress. It's time to let out frustrations to the point where it's like, I want to send you guys back to school or back to wherever. And even though their meltdowns are nowhere near the kind of thing that you're going through, I think like the psychology behind it is probably almost identical. Once you're in a, a area with people you're comfortable with and, you know, back in your home where you feel secure and safe, now you can let it all out. hundred percent. You know? Yeah, I agree. And that, that situation where you're in a, parent teacher conference and you're like are they talking about our kid we've actually said that multiple times in these throughout the years Uh uh-huh because like 
my Jamie and I look at each other and we're like shaking our head and like, there's no way what they're telling us is true. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think that's a big thing for parenting across the board is your own child disability or not develops a level of comfort with mom and dad. Right. And with that level of comfort, I mean, I would say all my kids respect me, but at the same time, they also know me well enough that they feel like they could confront me or they could talk back to me or they could not listen to me on a certain thing. And it gets to the point where I feel like I have the worst behaved kids on planet earth and it's frustrating. But then when I get all the feedback from their coaches and their teachers, it's like, okay, well, whatever we're doing is obviously working and at home is the only place where they're exhibiting these behaviors. Maybe it's not the end of the world. Right. You know, exactly. But yeah. so the, Originally, when we talked about doing this podcast, it was the idea was a lot less of necessarily what he goes through as an individual. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good thing to kind of bring people up to speed on what you go through and, and what he experiences and, and how he reacts to things, but how you deal with it as right. a parent. Right. Because I think every person that's listening that's a parent, as soon as that child is born, that now becomes the, the center of your universe, the center of your focus, the center of your energy. And your path is very different from anybody else out there that, that does not have a special needs child. Right. So I liken it to, well, how should I put this? I think that when if I had to describe my journey as a parent in one word, uh, I would say fascinating. And the reason I, like most, if you talk to parents of special needs kids, they, they might say hard or they might say, oh, it stretched me or whatever the case may be. Um, sometimes it might even be rewarding. Um, but my word is fascinating. And when I say that, I, I say it's fascinating because I have learned so much about who I am as a person, what it's going to take for me to be a good dad, how to uh, think on my feet and be strong, even in when I'm totally discouraged in a situation to lead well and be a, and, and raise a child despite the challenges in a good way. And to me, it's been it's been fascinating because uh, what happens when you first get that diagnosis or in my case, you first understand that things are going to be harder is you dive headlong into finding help for your child. Everyone does. And it makes sense. Mm -hmm. You need to. But what happens is, especially with autism, that is a giant rabbit hole. Finding help for your child because of the spectrum Every child's different. Every child's going to have different needs. Not, uh, you know, things that work for these kids over here might not work for yours. And so the fight to find help for your child becomes a 24-7 mission. Mm -hmm. And what happens, uh, and it happened to me because I'm, I'm saying this from experience and I see it happen to almost every other parent in my situation is you go, 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 go trying to find help for your kid and you forget about yourself. Yeah. And, um, when you don't pay attention to the amount of energy that you're putting into this and the exhaustion that you're facing and the mental health challenges that you're facing because of, uh, the love that you have for this child that seems to have these chains or these binders around their head and don't understand the world as you know it um, the mental weight that comes with that and the physical exhaustion it it compounds and it begins to slow you down and it begins to uh, not just slow you down but cripple you and in my case I got to a point it happened in 2012 this is shortly after, about a year after Max's official diagnosis. 
Um, there were a ton of other crazy things happening in our life at the time that, that contributed to this, but, um, when it rains, it pours. That's how it goes. Yeah. And, and I found like, I just one day had realized that I had slipped way beyond what I ever thought possible. Like I could go being an active guy my whole life and being, uh, raised in a really good home and parenting modeled well for me. And like, I can't complain about my upbringing at all. And I, I, I have everything going for me. Why am I struggling so hard mentally? And it, and it got to the point with all these other life things weighing on me, realizing this weight that I carry around that, um, I'm trying so desperately to help my son and nothing's working and what's going to happen tomorrow. What's going to happen when he hits puberty? What's going to happen when he's an adult? What's going to happen when I'm gone Mm -hmm. and no one's around to take care of him? Well, and I was going to say that to you when you mentioned that the word you chose to describe it as fascinating. And then you said, I've heard other parents describe it as hard. And I feel like if you're going to describe it as hard, at least when I think about every hard thing that I've done in my life, be it fighting or ranger school or deployed in a combat zone, every single thing that I've done that I would use the word hard to describe has an end date. Right. So on this day, I redeploy home. And if I, if I made it, then it's all over. Or this day, I graduate ranger school. And I think it would put you... I, I can see why you found yourself in a mentally like diminished state because if you, if you have a challenge that you're facing and the end date is never like, that's a hard concept to wrap your head around. Thank you for pointing that out because not many people pick up on that. So would you, now you describe it as fascinating. Do you think early on you may have described it as hard? Oh, uh, yeah, a hundred percent. I, I got pretty bad off, like to the point where I was not thinking clearly about my own life. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I ever would have done such a heinous thing, but when you get to a point where that's in the back of your mind all day, Mm -hmm. every day, you're like, it would just be better if I were, if I were gone. It's such a... Man, you're going to make me get emotional too because... Yeah, I, you're not, we're not supposed to cry. Are we supposed to cry on this podcast? Hey, I've, I've said on this podcast before, I didn't learn to cry until I was 35 years old and I turned 40 in about two months and I've cried more between 35 and 40 than the rest of my life combined. Yeah. And it, I mean, crying is a physiological mechanism that helps us purge stress. Yeah. So if anybody, if anybody thinks that it like makes you less manly or something to be ashamed of, they haven't walked in our shoes because it actually feels good. You cry a little bit and it's like, Oh, I can breathe now. Like I actually feel better. It didn't just come to fruition by chance. You know, it's a real thing going on in your body. But, uh, no, I mean, I think, uh, being able to acknowledge how you felt at that time. And then also, kind of relive that emotion. Like as you're sitting here talking about it now, it's stirring real mm-hmm. intense emotions in you. Yeah. And, and I talked about it on episode six about how I arrived at that same conclusion at one point in my life where I just think it's going to be easier, not only for me, but everybody involved if I'm just not in the picture anymore. Right. And then it's, it's just a weird thing in our brains that I don't, I don't even know where it comes from. But it's, it, it creaks, it's, it starts to creep its way in. And then it, you come to this conclusion, like, I think this, this may be an option. And it's, it's strange because the logical brain knows that's never an option. But there's a part of you that's, that's very illogical. Right. You know? And so hearing you say that, it might surprise some people, but it doesn't surprise me at all. Right. Because I've been there before. And so uh, Jamie's dad one day in the middle of just kind of my darkest moment 
um, pulls me aside. He's a health education professor, had been for 40 years, and uh, pulls me aside. And at this point, like the, the other stuff going on in my life needed a ton of attention. Max needed a ton of attention. My marriage needed a ton of attention because let's face it, autism has been the hardest thing on my marriage mm-hmm. um, f- f- in our tw- almost 20 years of being married. Um, he pulls me aside and he says, hey, are you exercising? And my first thought was, who is this guy? He is. Does he, he's not have a front row seat to my life right now. He knows how much stuff I've got going on. Sure, I'm an active guy and I've worked out like my whole life. But right now, I got some serious stuff to take care of. And um, how, it didn't feel like a priority. It, it, right. Uh-huh. It, it, and, but he comes to me and he says, hey, have you thought of this? And when you're deep in the throes of depression or you're, you're looking for any answer for your kid and somebody comes along and goes, hey, have you, have you tried this? Most of the time you want to slap them. Yep. Because you're like, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be here right now if I hadn't tried every last friggin' thing that came to mind. True. But the other side of the coin is, and I'm like, I feel like I'm just kind of learning this as I'm about to be 40. Anytime that the initial emotion is a a defensive emotion and you feel like you're on the defense, instead of being mad at that person, there's a deficiency in you that needs to be addressed. Right. And, you know, and I was smart enough to say, okay, my father-in-law is a health professional. I should probably listen to him uh-huh. at this point. And so. So you didn't go through with the slap? Then? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> right. I, I, I said, you know, you're, you're right. I've been an active person my whole life. I've worked out a lot throughout my life and I get it. And I do. I need to, I need to stop for a second. It takes 30 minutes and go on a run. Do whatever. Um, do some exercising. So I did. I started uh, just, just jogging more. And this was 2012, you said? Yeah. Okay. End of 2012. And as we, um, as I started to work out more, uh, things began to change. And I been, began to stop thinking about uh, the bad things and got more clarity of mind. And I'm like, hmm, there's something to this. And so I began to take exercise pretty seriously in in back then if you had to guess or maybe you know do you think it's like the actual chemical effect of exercising and releasing endorphins and just the physiological benefits that come with that or was it the fact that you were giving yourself some you time to reflect on you and think about the things that you need to change within yourself as opposed to 24 7 your concerns are on max Oh, 100% is both. I mean, uh, you know, since then, I've, I've studied why physical exercise is so good for your mental health. And, you, you know, your hippocampus, part of your brain, is responsible for memory and uh, some different thought processes. When you start exercising, you start, ch- like, changing the cell makeup. Uh, and and it, it tells your hippocampus to start working differently. And so you're, you're actually physiologically changing your mental health when you exercise. And so that when you start able to start thinking clearly and thinking differently and thinking healthy, then yeah, you start to think about, okay, this is good. Now I can step back. I can, I can think about me time. I can think about what it's going to take to keep doing this. How am I going to organize my day? Instead of a day being chaos, days became compartmentalized. Okay. Like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get up and I'm going to exercise before anybody's up. And, uh, and, and that in and of itself allows you to think more clearly throughout the rest of the day. And so it sort of builds on each other. And when you start thinking clearly and you're able to organize your day, now all of a sudden you're, you you don't have that same fog Mm -hmm. and like just chaos to your, to your mindset. You're more organized. You're you're uh, you're focused, and um, so I began like in in 2013. 
um, got to the point where it was, I mean, it was a very serious part of our life. We, you know, Jamie and I took exercise very seriously. And at that time, I didn't realize where I was going with it. And we'll get to kind of what it looks like today and why it looks like it looks today. Well, one thing that it looks like, for those of you watching on YouTube, is the room that we're in right now. Yeah. So, and if you're just listening, we're in Chad's home gym. Even though it looks like we're at 24-hour fitness, it's obvious that you've put a lot of attention and resources into developing something where you can really train your body and, and do it in a way that obviously is focused towards physical fitness. But like you're saying right now, it's the, the foundation of it is yeah. continuing to build your mental health. Yeah. And, and uh, side note, um, this entire house needs a, needs a giant remodel. Uh, and where did, do you think we spent the money and the time? Yeah, right, right here. here. This is the most important room in our house. It gets used every single day. That's awesome. During lockdown and when the schools uh, shut down, PE was in here. Mm-hmm. And we did family workouts every single day. Um, this I remember watching those on Instagram, feeling like a yeah. terrible parent. <laughs> like, I need to have my kids doing burpees or pull-ups yeah. or whatever. Well, it's been, you know... Um, we, we talk about it every day and now it's getting to the point where others are coming and uh, the, the, the invitation has been extended to some people in our community. Mm-hmm. And it's great because there's no uh, uh, other eyes watching what you're doing. Uh, this, there's an exterior door so you can come and go and not bother anyone else in the house. And um, it's neat because not only are we using it every day, but we're able to bless others with it too. And, um, so it's been good. That's but. awesome. You know, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I feel like the connection between the mind and the body is something that it should be black and white. It right. should be plain as day, but for whatever West, for whatever reason, it seems like the kind of the Western, the Western medicine approach to that is like, this is how you take care of your body over here. And this is how you take care of your mind over here. Yeah. And doesn't, understand that they're all intimately intertwined no and and uh, so i'm a christian and uh you talk with other christians and when you talk about mental health um and spiritual health like that's no that's you you just got to believe scripture you've got to um you got to listen to god's word and the promise that he has for your life you're not supposed to fear you're not supposed you know you know count it all joy when faced with trials like i'm just reciting scripture and um, that's fine and good. Um, but God also designed this body for work Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and when you don't put it to work, it begins to fail. Yeah. And, uh, the, the thing that it doesn't bother me, I would say, but I think about it from time to time is like the, in the Christian world, um, not enough emphasis is put on physical health. Uh, they think that, uh, you know, the, the, the more emphasis on spiritual health, which then helps your mental health. Um, but I'm saying, hey, you guys can't forget about the physical health, too, because that also helps. The three combined have to work in concert with one another. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you fo- hyper focus on one and leave one or two of the others out, you, you're not yeah, doing not yourself come any together. Good. Yeah. And so... I mean, that's, and you can, you can do an experiment and see that your physical health is related to your mental health in a week. Right. Like I just changed my diet on August 1st and I haven't had a carbohydrate in a week. And when you cut all carbohydrates out, you're looking for a physiological change and it happens because it works, but there's mental fog there's, I felt a little bit of depression trying to creep in. I just mm. kind of felt shitty for a few days. And I literally had to take a step back and be like, hey, these emotions you're feeling is because you're not feeding yourself the right. same kind of nutrients that you were a week ago. Right. This is a direct result of what you've put in your mouth. And so obviously if what you're feeding yourself can dictate a change in your mental health, exercising can do the same thing. Yeah. And obviously all the science is there to support it now, but it just seems like throughout history, we separated the mind and the body. Right. You know, it's just kind of bizarre. Yeah. And, 
I mean, we'll get into the the kind of the common denominator in my life to to focus on all of them is is the fact that I'm a parent of a special needs child. But um, kind of the path to get there uh, was interesting in that um, at that first year or so of really getting back into shape. I I recognized it immediately mm-hmm. um, within the first couple months. I'm I'm starting to mentally heal. And as you get physically stronger, your confidence goes up. So that helps your mental state too. Um, and then I think uh, that year, Jamie and I did a Tough Mudder together. And if you guys don't know what a Tough Mudder is, it's basically a 20 or a 11 mile mud obstacle course where they shock you with electricity and put you in an ice bath and dip you in the mud. So a lot of fun. Uh, dude, we had it. They are so much fun. I'll do the ice bath with you, but I think I'm done with electricity. I hate electricity. <laughs> yeah. the, the obstacle on that thing that scares me the most. But, um, and then when we got done with that, it was uh, the, there's so much camaraderie in those things. Like it's not a race. You're just filthy and bloody with a bunch of other people out there. And you're like grabbing strange dudes by the butt and throwing them up over an obstacle. And the next guy behind you is doing the same for you and all this stuff. And, Jamie and I got done with the first one we did. We did it just the two of us. And it was such a, um, a bonding experience for us. Uh And there's so much sense of accomplishment when you, when you pull that off. That's awesome. That you just, it fuels you to go further and further. And so that kind of, that season really kicked off, uh, what you see today. Um, well, and I mean, you said, it was just the two of us, but then you also said everybody was working together and helping each other out. And so I, th- I think anytime you're doing something with a group of people, even if you don't know those people, you're triggering like a, a primal reward system in your brain where I have a group of people with me and we're accomplishing a goal. And something about that just feels right. And yeah, I don't even know if you can put your finger on it, but since the beginning of time, if people wanted to eat or have a house or fight off the the rival horde that's coming to to take them over like they had to unify and they had to work together and then the reward back then it was life right you know now the reward is you get your medal and your picture at the tough mutter podium but on like a physiological level your body is still feeling those reward systems saying yeah we did it yeah we won you know and there's a reason why isolating yourself like solitary confinement is the worst thing you can do to a person Mm -hmm. because it's the complete opposite that you're depriving from those reward systems from having any input. Yeah. Yeah. So you speed the clock up a little bit in the years uh, after that um, is really when max became a pretty big challenge uh, for us. Uh, The behavior stuff was off the charts uh, so at what age would you say it started to become something that was became noticeably more difficult to control? Um, probably six or seven years old. And is that is that something that you could call typical or again, is it just every kid is different? Yeah, every kid's going to be different. Um, you know, I, I we run around with uh, other families that uh, deal with the same thing and every kid's different. Um, the blow ups uh, the, the meltdowns became more kind of explosions Mm -hmm. and, uh, tons and tons of anger. Uh, there'd been some violence, uh, to the point where at one point we actually considered putting Macy in some self-defense classes, uh, to deal with her own brother. And, um, so the, uh, the behavior stuff, the just the toxic things that he would say to us at those year, throughout those years. Uh, I hate you. I, I wish you were never my dad. I wish the cops would come arrest you and put you in prison so I don't have to see you again. Stuff Jeez. like that. Yeah. Like, you, on you one can, hand, you probably want to be like, that's not him. That's his disability speaking. But then yeah. on the other hand... Those are the words coming out of his mouth. Yeah, and you can't, you, you, there's, I don't care how strong you are, when you, when that's part of your DNA, uh-huh. that is your child, that 
has been placed in your care to raise and love and nurture says that stuff to you, man, it hits hard. It does. And uh, so that's that, the struggle for us, I think, was how do we how do we manage this thing where nobody's going to get physically hurt? Nobody's going to take more mental blows than they than they should. And. How are we going to help this in the middle of damage control? Yeah. How are we going to provide growth? Because the two are radically different and you're trying to do them at the same time. One In one breath, you're trying to stop the madness. And in the other, you're trying to shift gears and nurture and teach. So just so I'm tracking on the timeline, you said he got noticeably worse, both with the things he was saying and, and violent outbursts. Was this after you'd kind of had to had your self realization and were putting yourself on a better path? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so thank God, right? Exactly. Because if, yeah. if you had if if he'd taken a turn for what you determined to be the worst, and you were in the middle of that dark fog, yep, that just would have compounded everything. Hundred percent. Yeah, I'm glad my father-in-law caught me when he did. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um. As I always say that as his um, as his challenges and his outbursts and the kind of just raw display of who he is kind of grew in intensity, Jamie and I and our ability to deal with it also grew. Uh, I would say that maybe three years ago, if uh, I said this to a number of people, actually, if you would place me like just off the couch into that position as a parent, somebody would die. Yeah. Like there's no way I could go into that cold. It's just too, too crazy and too, too, too hard. But we, we had grown with it, you know, our mm. ability to deal with it, our systematic way of processing and helping. And, and, and I mean, the situation between Jamie and I as a married couple is a whole other podcast to do uh, because it's been the hardest part of our marriage. We have a great marriage um, and we love each other, but we work really hard. I mean, we, we see a counselor even when times are really good. We still see a counselor because we're doing maintenance all the time and we're, we're not ever going to let anything get in the way because neither one of us could do this on our own. Uh huh. And so we're, we're a team. So you're stuck with each other. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good thing. <laughs> no, too. but I mean, yeah, a lot of times hard times are stressful on marriages, but those same experiences, once you work your way through the weeds, like you're better off for it and you're yeah. closer for it. I mean, this is, this is the, that's the general theme of this whole conversation is the challenges that we hate at the outset. We see that, oh, when we get on the other side of them, that actually made me stronger. And now I can look back at it as, like, as a benefit, and I'm actually glad I went through that. And so it changes your thinking in terms of moving forward. Hmm maybe challenges aren't such a bad thing. They suck yeah. and they're painful and you hate going into them. But if I, if I keep a level head and, and I uh, keep my wits about me, uh, I'm going to, I know that when I get on the other side of this thing, I'm going to be stronger and better and I want to be stronger and better. So why am I not embracing it? Yeah. Why am I not embracing the painful moments? What a powerful perspective to arrive at. You know, because nothing through, through the school of hard knocks, man. nothing in this life worth having comes without a tremendous amount of hard work. Right. And so if you want to be physically fit, if you want to be a good fighter, or if you want to be intelligent, like anything, any goal that you're trying to obtain comes with hard work and you have to do things that do not feel good. Things that are not fun sitting down and studying for two hours or going and hitting the road for five miles when you're already exhausted. Like all of those things, you got to put the work in if you want the result. But the interesting thing about the work you were putting in, it seems like up front, it wasn't 
result oriented. It was just kind of this storm that you were in. It's damage control. Yeah, yeah, just damage control. And now when you're able to almost detach a little bit and, and look big picture, you're seeing that that same storm is now giving you benefits on the back end. It's pretty fascinating. Well, I see why you use the word fascinating because it is. I, I mean, I've just exactly been talking. Yep. I've just been talking to you about it for an hour, and now I'm seeing like, wow, Chad sees the cards that he was dealt is actually a blessing now. It almost sounds like hundred percent. That's cool. Yeah, I would not be the the man that I am today, and let's be honest, I got a long ways to go. As but, as we all do. Yeah, but um, I know that I'm physically, mentally, and spiritually stronger because of my situation. And I like that. That's cool. Yeah. So, Um, yeah, I mean, maybe to a point where you even needed it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, you can, uh, when you get to the other side of something and you realize the growth and the strength that you gained, you realize at that point that you needed it. Uh Uh-huh. You don't, you can't ever see that you need it before it happens. Unless you've been through them enough times Uh to recognize that, hey, I need another hard moment. Well, and to circle back to what I said a few minutes ago, is like your challenge has no end date. Right. So knowing that it has no end date, the only perspective that you could really come to that's going to allow you to live in peace is exactly that. Like, hey, this is... This is another challenge in my life, and I know I'm going to be better off for it. Right. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So our um, our physical exercise component of our lives uh, went from I need to get healthy, and I need to get my play, my own self in a place where I can I can manage better. Um, so, like I said, everything's working in concert. So you're. Uh, as you begin to exercise, your mental health is better. Uh, that in turn, your spiritual health, you're just in a better place. And so as you go from a point, uh, a focus, I should say, of um, that damage control to getting healthy, you get to that point and you're feeling good. And, you, and then you begin to realize that... Um, what this is doing in my body physiologically, what it's doing in my mind, who it's creating me to be. And so why wouldn't I take it one step further? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't I want just a little bit more growth in all those areas? And so when you're feeling good and you're, you're feeling fine and exercise is going great, you're eating right, you're sleeping well, uh, you're content you either go, okay, I'm either going to get a little bit complacent or I'm going to put the next hard thing in my path because I need a little bit more growth. I need to be better at these all these areas of my life. Mm-hmm. And um, that's, so I would say probably 2015 forward, we shifted from getting healthy to we're doing this for a different reason now we're doing this because um we want to provide the absolute best for our kids and so in order to do that we have to be at the very top of our game mentally and physically um because max hasn't grown out of all of those challenging moments Mm -hmm. But our ability to see them coming, have the energy to uh, intercept anything that we need to, deal with the with the you know the violence, the the, the punches and the kicks, um, and deal with those nasty words that are coming out of his mouth. Um, now we're at a point where we're actually training our body to be better in in that environment and so uh i always tell people like if you're gonna if you're gonna run a marathon you're not just gonna go out and run a marathon you're gonna train for it Mm -hmm. if you're gonna become an attorney you're not just gonna go take the bar you're gonna study for it this stuff takes time and it takes energy and it takes work and 
if you want to be a good parent, especially a good parent in our, a situation like ours where you've it's just extraordinary, um, you've got to train for it. And so we do. And so we deliberately put really difficult things in our path so that we can prove to ourselves that we can we have the energy to fight, we have the mental acuity to get past it, and we're going to be stronger on the other side. And so, yeah, we've done it a ton with exercise, um, but one of the things that I've really appreciated about you and uh, getting to visit you at your home and jumping in your ice bath, yeah. the, um, you know, leading up to that point, I had kind of dabbled in my own bathtub and stuff. Your ice tub's like on a whole different level than a, a bathtub full of ice water. If, if people aren't familiar with my ice tub, I took a chest freezer, I caulked all the seams, and I filled it up with water. I plug it in. Well, I fill it up with salt water, so it can even get below normal freezing. I plug it in till it freezes over, and then I break it up with a sledgehammer. And so I've, I've checked the temperature a few times, and it's like 29, 30 degrees when, it's, when the ice is freshly broken, you yeah. know, and it's... Uh, yeah, it's a it's a religious experience getting in so that thing. you invite me over. I don't know, it was a couple summers ago or whatever it was, and and uh, you go, you know, every I tell everybody to to jump in this thing, just try it for a minute, and uh, we get to the point where you're gonna set the timer. You're like, okay, I'm gonna set the timer for two minutes. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> wait a minute, bro, what happened? To the That's one because minute? I already know you're tougher than most of my friends, so you get double the exposure. <laughs> but the reason I was totally up for jamming over there and doing something that uncomfortable was because I needed to, I, w I needed to check in and see how strong my mind was. Mm -hmm. And there is no surreal mind experience like getting in 29 degree water and sitting perfectly still. No, I've seen, I mean, my jujitsu team, a lot of guys come over and give it a try. And I've seen guys, who could strangle almost every human being you know. And in a, in a street fight, they're going to maul these people. They get up to their knees in that water, and they jump out, and they say, no way. Yeah. And for me, that's why it's so important, because like we already previously touched on, there's the mind, there, and then there's the body, and then the spirit. What I find in the ice is that you're, it's, it's really combining the mind and the body into one exercise yeah. because you have to find that peace within your mind to allow the body to do that. And some people just, even people with really tough bodies, sometimes the mind won't allow them to just submerge themselves and just do it. Yeah. And I, I think I mentioned it in the video that I did when I did it is it's a surreal experience sitting trying to sit perfectly still while something is trying to kill you. Mm -hmm. And because that's what's happening. Is second, the second you get in that water, you've begun dying. Yep. And uh, since the beginning of history, if you fell into water that felt like that, that's exactly what that means. You're going to die. Yeah. Because even if you get out and make it to shore, if you don't have heater or you don't have somewhere to get out of the elements, because let's face it, if you experience that, in a natural setting, it's because you're on the Arctic tundra or something. Right. And that means hypothermia and death. Yeah. So all of those emotions and chemical reactions that are associated with, oh shit, I'm dying, they're still hardwired into us. And that's the same thing you feel when you get into there. And it's uh, it just ignites that panicked, startled response. And that's what I love about it. Because no matter how many times you do it, it's always going to ignite that. But what you can find is you can learn to control that and you can control that to the point where now I can get in the water and not even have a visible physiological reaction. Right. I'm still feeling it I, no matter. And I've tried. I always say I want zero physiological reaction when I get into the water. I want to be able to get in mid sentence like I'm talking to you right now and continue. And I've tried that and it's inevitably there's still a little. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, I'm good now. And now I can start talking to you. But you can see someone that hasn't done it before that's trying. I mean, there's people that they're they're wincing and they're screaming and they're like 
their bodies flailing around. Like it, it just, it does things to people that they don't expect. Yeah. And so that's why I always tell, I always, I'm an advocate of getting in the ice because again, it's, it's something that you can really test your mental resolve. hundred mm-hmm. percent. I mean, the vast majority of the population will never get in that ice bath. Right. I mean, uh-huh. like, why would you do something so stupid? Well, I always get pushed back from people like that. They're like, exactly that. That's stupid. I don't need to do that. And it's like, you're right. Nobody needs to do it, but can you? Right. Like if I paid, if I paid you a thousand dollars, do you think you could sit in there for five minutes and not wince at all? Like the answer is no, because if you haven't put yourself there before, right. you don't know what you're about to get into and it's the unknown. And I, and I like that. You and know? The, the primary reason I did it is, uh, because I wanted to know how I can respond under uh, intense mental pressure. Mm-hmm. Um, I do liken it to the difficulties of parenting. And there are moments um, where I'm under attack. I've either, I'm either under attack mentally with the words that are coming out of my son's mouth or I'm under attack physically. I don't usually f- face the blows. It's usually Macy and Jamie that have to deal with the violence. And I step in. He knows he he can't really do that. But I want to be mentally stronger in those moments. I want to be a good dad. I want to go, okay, there's there's a thousand wrong ways to take to to respond here. I want to pick the one right one. Mm-hmm. And getting in the ice was an exercise in, for me in can I have the mental wherewithal to withstand the attack and come out stronger and better because of it. And people are like, dude, that's a stretch to, to be drawn that line, but it's not until they get in. Yeah. You know? And, and, uh, and I guess my response would be, well, then you, you must not want it that bad to, mm-hmm. to, to be able to, to operate at that level. And I do, I want, I want to be the best dad possible and I'll try stuff like getting in the ice and, and, uh, I'll do these crazy workouts that, uh, that my sister or Jamie will put together and, uh, knowing that I'm going to be miserable for the three days after that because of the punishment that you entail. But well, and anybody that's done your sister's workouts knows exactly what you're talking about right they are straight evil yeah. like that was a picture of me on instagram a couple of days ago laying on the gravel after i puked so right. Right. <laughs> shout out Ange fit if she's right and then, and then you've got uh, my wife who celebrates her uh third year uh, being cancer free three years is 1095 days she's like hey let's do a 1095 rep workout and, uh, <laughs> so we did five exercises 219 reps of each. Oh, I, I heard. Yeah. I heard that was <laughs> from Angie, who's someone that just works out like a demon every single day of her life. She's like, that workout was unlike anything I've done before. Yeah. Broke and her I, off. Uh, well, 219 wall balls, that alone. Right. Yeah. No, it was, <laughs> it was brutal. And, uh, but those are the kinds of things that, um, that I feel like Jamie and I have to do. And, and other parents of special needs kids might think I'm absolutely out of my mind. Um, but I, I, I have to do that stuff. I have to deliberately put. So, so when I, when, when we put those painful moments in our path, mm-hmm. we make a choice. That's our crafting. That's our implementation. It's all us. Yes. And, and we get to choose dude in with autism. You never get to choose you're going to have to deal with what you're going to deal with. And so for me, it's like, Hey, I'm going to train for that marathon. Um, because I'm not going to do this life as a parent with this child without training. My kid deserves better than that of me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if I've got a choice, how much cooler is it to have my own crafted, uh, moment of pain, uh, that's going to create growth the, where I get to choose. It's easy compared to what I have to deal with in the real world. Yeah. 
and we should really feel fortunate that the the place where humanity's at we do get to pick those moments when we subject ourselves to pain and discomfort yeah you know i think i mean l- since the beginning of time and there's a reason why to, to circle back where he's like you said as a christian like i tell people do something hard with your body there's a reason why all these years later when we could sit on the couch all day and eat Doritos and do nothing. There's a reason why not doing that feels good. And that's because since the beginning of mankind, Mm -hmm. in order to obtain the necessities of survival, gathering your food, building your shelter, like the things that you need. And if you don't do this, you're going to die. You're going to starve. You're going to freeze to death. It takes hard work. It does. So from literally from the beginning of time, we've made this association between hard work and survivability. Mm -hmm. And I would say, I mean, when did that, when did humanity lose that within the last hundred years, 200 years? Yeah. Yeah. And so just because technology has brought us to a point where I can now make my entire living on Google, I can make, you know, there's people that are getting rich making making YouTube YouTube videos. videos. I mean, we're sitting here doing a podcast right now. Right. Like, that's kind of where society's gone. But if you don't address those primal needs that have been intertwined in our physiology since the beginning of time, you're missing out on something. Yeah. I mean, we were designed to work. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you're, you know, if you, if you believe the Bible and, and God created man and he basically said, here's, here's the earth go and work. He put, put it, put this, Thing together that required man to keep it going uh-huh and so that's that what you talk about like having one meal a day after you went out and hunted or fished or whatever and uh the other family members were gathering and you all came together and you had one meal you were all working hard to survive and um and then again one when, when that task is complete there's some weird reward system that's being fired up like Yes, I did that. Yeah. This feels right. Like I, I didn't die today. <laughs> yeah. My buddy Charles, he sent me a text message a couple of days ago. And he's a he's a black belt in jiu-jitsu under Joao. Like we, we met through training and he's a savage, like super fit, super tough. He sends me a text message. He's like, Hey, I pushed a wheelbarrow full of dirt around in the woods for a couple hours. And I feel fucking incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes, hashtag man shit. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. I just got a good laugh out of it, you know. But it, it, even though it is funny and it was kind of a joke, at the same time, hey, pushing a wheelbarrow around full of dirt for two hours makes you feel good. Yeah. Like, what is that? What's going on? You know, it's exactly what's going on. It's, it's the, triggering. It's, the way we were designed. it's triggering that primal reward yeah. mechanism. Mm-hmm. Like you go do this and it's going to hurt and you're going to sweat and your muscles are going to be screaming. And as soon as the work's done, there's your reward. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the, the, the thing about it is um, getting to the point where that's your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. This is not a, oh, I got to train for something and then I'm going to coast. This is not, oh, I feel good mentally. Um, I'm just going to go binge watch uh, some sh- TV shows now. This is, this is work, and it's ongoing, and it's a lifestyle. Yep. I mean, you catch Jamie and I at the airport. Most of the time, we're waiting for an airplane, and there's push-ups and crap going I on. I do the same stuff. Yeah. Like people are looking at me like, who's this lunatic? Right. I actually usually do, uh, if I'm at the airport, I do mobility and stretching because right. I know I'm going to be in a seated position. Right. For the next six hours or whatever. Yeah. And we have uh, wood burning heat here in this house. And so like when it comes time to bring firewood from uh, the back of the property up to the house for in the fall, dude, it's on. Like everybody's running with arms full of wood. Like the, the, the kids get the wheelbarrow and Jamie and I just have to run and do car- carry with our arms. And okay, it's throw those logs on the on the pile and drop down and do 20 push-ups because... It's push-ups at this end, and it's whatever, burpees at the other end. And, uh-huh. and we'll go, you know, an hour of loading firewood, and, and it's a lifestyle. you got to make a choice to always be thinking about being sharp and being ready. Um, well, I like the fact that you said, like, once you've arrived at your goals or that it, 
it's not time to slack off now or take it easy because what I've noticed in myself is certain activities, be it working out or jujitsu that helps me get out of a, a, say like a mental funk or that, that fog of depression. The same is true in reverse. As soon as you start to neglect yourself or you, you stop training, that stuff starts creeping back in. Yeah. For me, it's almost immediately. Right. And, uh, you know, I got hurt a couple of weeks ago and I, I mean, I've been working out for 20 years now pretty consistently and I took, I mean, I probably took 10 days off from training and not only did I start to feel mentally worse, but my back started seizing up mm. and I started like cramping and I was like, I mean, I was just talking to Jenny about this in bed. I'm like, I've literally taken 10 days off of training and my back feels the worst that it's felt in as long as I can remember. And I went to the doctor and he goes, that's because you work out all the time. He goes, and maybe you can look at this like a curse, but a guy that trains almost every single day, now that you've stepped away from training, he goes, I always tell my athletic patients no more than six days off from doing something. Wow. Because you have created a pattern in your physiology where your body expects to go through work. Mm -hmm. And then when you deprive it of that work, he goes, your muscles are starting to cramp up and spasm because they're not being exposed to what they're used to being exposed to. Interesting. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, but it made perfect sense when yeah. he explained it to me. Well, and it, and it happens faster than we we expect any time. Mm -hmm. um, I, like I said, so this, this mission started five years ago. Well, last year, not even a year ago, um, I was struggling with some career stuff, um, just not super happy. Uh, with w what was going on uh, it, you know I'm a, a business owner and so I make all the choices so I can't blame anybody but me right <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Uh, turn, I, turn around and look in the mirror right, if you're angry right now right. and so but I was frustrated with some some aspects of of my career and dude it wasn't it wasn't two shakes before all of a sudden I felt depression knocking at the door mm -hmm. and it happened fast. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second, man. I thought I kicked all this crap. Yeah. And, um, that was right around October, November. And, uh, you and I don't get to see each other all that often, but we happened to be in the same place for Thanksgiving. And, uh, and you at that time said to me, um, Hey man, cause you, last year you you had some knee problems and you were thinking about doing that 50 mile, Mount yeah. Rainier, crazy yep. death march, right? And, I uh, watch, I mean, like you said, keeping, always keeping your goals high and wanting to do the next hardest thing. Yeah. I see other human beings out there like Cam Haynes and David Goggins just running endlessly. And I'm right. like, I can do that. Could I do that? Yeah. Like, I don't want to say I can. I want to say, can I? And yeah. then there's only one way to find out. Right. So yeah, I got spun up on that. And uh, not to take you off on a tangent, but... David Goggins, are you familiar with him? Oh, yeah. Okay, so he wrote the book, I, You Can't Hurt Me. Right. And one of his things was just run through the pain. The body figures it out. The body heals itself. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think my body, I, I didn't get the genetic lottery that he got. Your run, leg completely fell apart. Run through the pain. The MRI results three months later showed me that I ground all the cartilage off of my femoral condyle. And so, yeah, I was to a point where... They told me I'd need a full knee replacement before I'm 40 because of that. And it wasn't just from training for that ultra. It was just a lifetime of rangering and carrying heavy stuff around. Right. But yeah, I can't, yeah, that's what I was told. Like, you're going to need a full knee replacement. Yeah. And so I was bummed out that I couldn't do that. Yeah. Well, and, and, uh, and so the conversation went something like this. Uh, we weren't able to do that. And, and I didn't say a word to you at the time about where I was at mentally, mm -hmm. but I was, I was slipping and I was struggling and I was pissed because dang, dang it. I thought I kicked all this. I thought I was past all this depression stuff. I've been working really hard on all aspects of my being to fight it. And one little hiccup in a season of my career. And I, it was just trying to kick down the door again. And you and I bump into each other at Thanksgiving and um, the, the 50 mile thing didn't work and we're like, well, what could we do? And you said, dude, let's try Let's do a triathlon, lower impact, 
mm-hmm. then a 50 mile like what was that thing like 17,000 vertical feet or something yeah, crazy like that. something nuts. Uh, it was through the mountains yeah and uh and, I, and, I, and the light went on and uh, this is something I wanted to share today during this recording was um w- wait a minute I think having a goal a big goal at this point would be really good for me not a goal that I can achieve next week uh-huh a goal that I have to fight for the next nine months to get to that will take my mind off my crap that I'm dealing with at work and allow me to uh, to, to to put my sights on something and work hard for it and I think and in the past when I was doing damage control exercise just trying to get healthy mm-hmm. that was my mentality is okay just gotta just gotta get to feeling better and so I knew that it worked and so I get I kind of uh, we left Thanksgiving and uh, you know I, I I can't remember if we texted at all or whatever about doing maybe doing some triathlons or something but I just went ahead and signed up for a half Ironman and I didn't own a road bike and I'd never done any distance swimming mm-hmm. and uh, and I'm like screw it let's just do it and um, I did not so when I put that goal out in front of me knowing that dude i'm gonna uh, first off i'm gonna have to buy a road bike because i've never done that before you know uh and like there's all these hurdles like this is and and i can't just train to swim five days a week because i gotta think about the bike yeah, i gotta, gotta think about the run so all of a sudden i just put this monument for me it was a monumental thing in front of me because one i felt like i could my physical fitness i could probably get there but like i don't know what i'm doing on a road bike yeah uh, I, well I, I went riding with you and it, it appears otherwise <laughs> <laughs> well what i realized is okay good, you know what having a goal is is excellent it's actually doing a really good rework in my brain and my mental health because um it's it's giving me a chance to to look outwardly instead of inwardly into my current situation look out into the future mm-hmm. and say okay, here's a prize, you know, that, that primal prize that you're yeah. talking about, like here it is, it's out there. I got to fight for it. Cause I don't know how to do these, some of these disciplines and I got to work toward it. And I, I thought this is, this is great to have goals. This is going to help me mentally. I didn't know how much it actually was helping me mentally until COVID hit and that stupid race got postponed. Oh yeah. Dude, yeah. I got the email like, I'm going to be 40 this year, grown man. I get that email after training for three straight months, four straight months, hard. Race has been postponed. I started bawling. And I'm like, holy cow. That's what was keeping you on the path. It was like this big tool, this thing, this goal, Mm -hmm. this tool I was using to conquer something in my life and to get back on track mentally got taken away from me. And I, I, I was like, it surprised me, my reaction to that. Yeah, that's like, incredible. I started bawling. Because there's two things that come to mind when you, when you share that story. And the first thing is, like I talked about on my mental health podcast, once you've been through the storm and you realize what tools help you get out of it, I mean, what a blessing. Now you have that tool in your toolbox, and when depression hits again, well, boom, this is my solution. Yeah. And so you said... You started to feel it and you knew that finding a really difficult goal to pursue would be beneficial to you to putting to beating it this time or getting, you know, basically getting out of the storm. But then the other side of that is you're almost reliant on that goal, too. Yeah. You know, and I don't know if that's I'm not saying that's a bad thing. No, but it's, it's interesting. Take. It's, I it's, an, of it. it's an interesting thing to think about because as soon as that was taken away from you, it was like it almost sounds like fear was the emotion that you were feeling. Hmm. You know. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't uh, actually considered that, but that is that's interesting. Yeah. And again, that's not a bad thing. I mean, if you have a tool to help you progress in something, and then that's taken from you, if you're trying to dig a hole with a shovel and someone pulls that shovel out of your hands and says, now, now use your hands. Yeah. Like that's, that's going to suck. Yeah. But at the same time, that might be what you have, what you have to do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I was, I could tell how 
bummed you were when that race was canceled. Well, first it was postponed. Yep. So then talk me through that then, because the story's not over. Well, so they postponed it. Well, till well, the, story, the story's over now for me. Um, well, yeah, because no, it was finally. it's not actually over because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to physically do one. Uh-huh. So when you say, well, let's, let's back up for people that are just listening. He paid for the Ironman race. He was training for it. You got the email that it was postponed, and it just devastated you. And then a follow-up email came through and said, hey, it's actually canceled all Well, what had happened is they said, we're going to postpone it until September. And it was a date where I have a commitment every year yeah. to be here in town on that weekend. Oh, of course it was. Yeah. yeah and I, and then, so I emailed them and I said, hey, I can't, I can't make that date. And Iron Man, in all their wisdom, said, well, we're sorry. That's tough. You can transfer to any of these 10 races all of which you have to fly to. Uh huh. Um, are you cover? Are you covering the airfare? Right. Uh, <laughs> and, and and or you can you can defer payment to the full Ironman next year because I, I don't know how many, with the Coeur d'Alene half Ironman every so often they run a full and so I was like, well, okay. I I don't want to do this thing. This is a goal that I have that I want to get done with. Yeah. You can't postpone it a year. Yeah. I, uh-huh. I don't want, I like, I don't want to ride my road bike anymore. I want to ride my mountain bike. Uh huh. I don't want to run. I want to do, I want to do functional fitness with my wife in our gym. I like, I want to get back to my other stuff. Yeah. Um, I wanted to get the, I wanted to like accomplish something and get it done. And when they postponed it and then it was a date that I couldn't make. And then it was, no, we're not going to give you a refund. It was like, just, just kick me while I'm down. Yeah. You know? And then, um, just a couple weeks ago, I think it was now, um, got the email that the thing's been completely canceled and they still won't give the refund. Yeah. This is, <laughs> we just turn this into a, a right. hate on Iron Man podcast, <laughs> right. but I mean, the truth is all this COVID stuff, there's so many things that individuals and companies are experienced for the first time and they don't have the answer to. But at the end of the day, if you take somebody's money in agreement to provide a service for them, and then you say, you know what, I'm not going to provide that service. I think that falls under some type of theft. (laughs) I think that's still illegal. So, well, it's funny because they were like, well, we'll give you $75 $75 of the 300 back, back when they postponed it. Oh, and I'm wow. like, well, you know what? For 75 bucks, just keep me registered. If I can make it, I'll come. Yeah. And then it was canceled. And I'm like, no, I, I need a refund. They're like, no, it's not even the $75. <laughs> off to. I'm like, man, you guys suck. But anyways, I, uh, um, I'll probably end up just going for it. Like uh, on my Strava app. So you're just going to plan out a, uh, an, and a half is the, uh, 1.2 mile well, swim, 56 mile bike and a half marathon. Correct. You're just going to plan out a route wherever. So, you know, you still did the work. It's already in my routes in Strava. It's okay. there. It's waiting to be conquered. Do you have a date on that yet? Not, no, not to put gonna, you on the I, spot. I was going to do it actually back in June when the race was supposed to happen and it got postponed and I was going to do it then. Oh, and, so that kind of threw you for a loop yeah, on planning. Then, Right. And then, uh, and I got kind of frustrated, um, with, I I just, I, I got kind of tired of training for a road bike and dude, running's not that fun. And I just kind of got, it was just like, dang it. I just wanted to get this done and over with. I've been mountain biking a ton this summer, like a ton. I'm going out probably, um, if I, if I ride 10, 15 miles in a week, like I'm slacking off. And so I don't want to get on my road bike. Yeah. I think so. I've actually kind of slipped in my training a little bit for it. When Um, I'm, when I'm doing a lot of road biking, something that I notice is it's, uh, yeah, obviously it's good exercise, but it's also very time consuming. Yeah. I mean, I used to go out and do 80 mile mornings and you're putting a couple hours in versus, you know, that, dude, that's a four hour ride. Or, yeah, yeah, a, okay. four hour, yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, four hour. I'm not, yeah, I'm not Lance Armstrong. That takes me a long time. But yeah, me and uh, my buddy Scott used to go out and do 80 mile rides. And exactly right. Like not only driving and, and all the other little things to where you're starting from and then 
you know, getting home and cleaning your bike up. Like that's a substantial amount of time. It's half a Saturday. That's dedicated to just me and my bike. Right. And now with three little kids, it's just, it's not as feasible. Oh you know? yeah. So what I've focused on is, uh, because like, I can't forget about the fact that I really want to be a good dad. Right. So that's part, you know, really why we're here today yeah so <laughs> at some point it becomes counterproductive like well yeah i'm trying to work out to be a better dad at, and now i'm gone all the time well and and i've treated training for that and mountain biking this summer as like i'm getting up at five i'm going with the boys uh -huh. and we're gonna we're gonna get rowdy and dirty and we're coming back and i'm gonna be pouring a cup of coffee when max rolls out of bed yeah you know so but that what happens is you're like Dude, if you get up at five every morning and go hard and burn, you know, 1,200 calories to start your day, uh, nine o'clock rolls around, 9 p.m., and yeah, there's, you're toast. there's not a lot left in the tank. For and, sure. And when the, when the summer's going strong and it's light late and Max is like, hey, let's go out in the backyard and play tackle football, like, man, I can't. I can't say no. Yeah, the answer is let's go. Let's do this. And so that, that like, I think I posted on Instagram about that uh, a while back. Like, this is why, this is partly why I train so much. I'm too tired, cannot be part of my parenting vocabulary. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And it also yeah. makes me feel like a shitty parent because <laughs> I think it is part of my parenting vocabulary, you know? But uh, no, I needed to hear that. Um, Something that I was wondering about, all of this physical training that you implemented into your life to make you a better parent for a special needs child, you said you had them in here doing burpees and pull-ups and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any correlation between Max training personally and then how he deals with his disability or his behavior patterns or anything like that? Well, we didn't get him in here uh a ton until the whole COVID thing yeah. and lockdown. And then we were in here every day. Absolutely every aspect of our life was different at that point. Yeah. So it was kind of hard to gauge. Yeah, um, you can't really quantify anything. Right. Because we're but, all just boarded up. But it, it did do something as a family camaraderie thing. I mean, we took that time uh, where everybody sort of sheltered in place. Mm -hmm. and You watched we, Tiger King together? <laughs> right. <laughs> we were incredibly deliberate about making memories and uh, like, Hey, we dug Jamie's wedding dress out of the box. I after saw that 19 years. We dressed up in wedding attire and like recreated our wedding. Just like, in your house with your, yeah. with your, with the four of you guys. We filmed a music video uh, to hotel California because you know, you can never leave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we like literally had a feast and danced in the courtyard and all like all this stuff. And um, well, it actually, <laughs> to be completely honest, it makes me happy hearing about the things that didn't are not going well in your life or the things you feel vulnerabilities attached to. Because uh, me and Jenny seeing you on Instagram doing that stuff, I'm like, man, we're the worst parents <laughs> ever, dude. Oh, Chad and Jamie are like doing formal dinners and stuff with their kids, and we're just sitting here putting. YouTube on again yeah. so we can just get a little bit of quiet time in the house. But in that in that time, I think all of the all the stuff we were trying to do, just being deliberate about yeah. family time, uh, because like there's a high likelihood that we were all going to strangle each other at some point. Right? Oh, of course. I mean, any family cooped up for that long is going to get that. And we're not out of the woods yet on that. Right. Exactly. And so one of the things that I uh, I did notice was that the time in this gym, which we called PE, uh -huh. uh, and it was always at the end of Jamie and my work day, we would go, all right, kids, we're done at the computer. Um, put your shoes on. We're going in the gym. We're going to have PE. And it was always a partner workout. So like you had to rely on the other person for a, some sort of functional uh, movement. And it was... That's a pretty smart approach. Yeah, and it just built a, it built a camaraderie where... Um, Hey, we, we work out together, we eat together, we laugh together, um, and occasionally we're going to get fired up, get pissed at each other, and there's going to be some screaming and stuff, but um, this is all stuff we're going to do together, and we're going to love each other through it, and we're going to work together through it, and so that's the biggest thing I noticed about having Max in here working out. Yeah. He, uh, 
we still make him come in here from from time to time um but he's actually found that he likes hiking and That's awesome. so jamie will take him uh, out in the woods and in fact i think they're out hiking right now oh really yeah so i think every single family with kids in school the whole covid lockdown thing and now that they're not going to school and and kind of like what we touched on earlier you said it seems like school is a place where he behaves well mm-hmm. he seems to enjoy it and home is where he is allowed to kind of decompress and vent a little bit yeah I've seen it in my household with all three of my girls, like not going to school and having that social aspect of their day has put them in a position where their fuse is shorter. They're at each other's throats more often. And to tell you the truth, the fact that they're not going back to school next year, like we're trying to find private school as we speak, because that's tough for me to think about them continuing down that path Mm -hmm. because I'm not a teacher. And the whole homeschool thing has been really tough for me and my wife. Yeah. Like, did it kind of exasperate his behavior when they took school away from him? Did oh, he, yeah. Yeah. 100%. I mean, for years, Jamie and I have said, there's no way we can homeschool our son. And then COVID hit. So now you have to figure out and a way. We were like, hey, remember all those times we said, there's no way we could do this? This season is proving that. <laughs> yeah because it was off the rails almost every day mm-hmm. and this is max's safe place this is where he gets to decompress this is where he gets to stim and um be himself school is where he puts in the hard work we put the two together and i think it was just too confusing and too too hard for him and well it doesn't work no, because it's I mean, disability or not, the, how you describe that, like this is his place to decompress schools where he goes and puts in the work. It's the exact same dynamic with my children. And I literally think you have to physically go somewhere. You have to go. You have to leave your house and your things and you, like your change of, environment. Yeah, change of environment, because it's just too easy if you're sitting at the the desk in your living room to then walk into the kitchen, get something to eat. And then the, the remotes right there, you turn the TV on. And it's when I had three girls going through that at the same time, it felt like every day was just pandemonium, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was rough. We, uh, we really struggled through it. And to the point where like you, we're trying to figure out alternative education for next year. So for anyone listening, up in, in Washington State, they've already announced that the the next school year's well, it's not canceled, but it's all online. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's chain if that changes county to county. I've heard some counties are thinking about like one day in person, one day remote, and some weird algorithm that they're gonna come up with to minimize exposure. But where we're at in Snohomish County, it's one hundred percent at home learning over the internet. Yeah, and, and it, we're a little bit different in it, over here in central Washington. We're in Kittitas County, Ellensburg School Districts. We're we're um, we have a little bit different uh, system, but it's been so hard to chase down the information, and the information seems to change every day. Yep, that you you kind of give up like getting updates. You're just like screw it, man. I'll find out on September first what I'm doing on September second. Well, and that's that kind of seems to be par for the course for everything COVID related. Right. You know? Yeah. And so with Max's individualized education plan, he gets kind of a hall pass on some stuff. So like, uh, there was some talk that you'd be going every other day. Um, but kids on IEPs might like if the doors of the school are open, they get to go. Oh, and okay. So, so our situation with our daughter, Macy and, our situation with Max, two radically different things um, and two totally separate sets of decisions that we have to make for our kids' education while they're in the same school district or have been since, you know, the beginning. We ha- we're now we're faced with two radically different, like given Macy the choice, like, hey, how do you want your education to look? Yeah, you know, and, and, I, you and I'm almost to the point where I'll do that with my oldest daughter. But I feel like, again, like I said, physically going somewhere and putting in the work, they're at the age now where that's 
that should still be a requirement. Yeah. You know, like I feel like my kids stare at screens enough throughout the day that the last thing I want them to do is have their entire education through a screen as well. Right. Yeah. And then the other side of it is I'm just, I'm literally not capable of being a teacher for my oldest anymore. Well, Her, especially when you're, when your kids get to the age where like, crap, I can't remember this math. That's what I was just going to say. Like, and she's, uh, she was in the sixth, going in the sixth grade. But they, so you just realized you have a sixth grade math level? That's exactly right. <laughs> no, but they actually want her, they said they want her to skip sixth grade math and go right into seventh, eighth. Mm. As, I mean, everybody thinks their kids are special, right? <laughs> but when it comes to math, my daughter's special. And she just gets it. And she has her mother's math brain. Mm. And so <laughs> I realized real quick, sitting at the kitchen table with her, I'm like, well, this is kind of embarrassing to say, but... I'm not much help to my 11 year old daughter in regards to math anymore, you know, well, and, even Plus, and they teach it very different. Exactly. Now, I was going to yeah, say yeah. is, is like, you, you know, you used to, you see all these memes when homeschool kind of kicked in about like common core math. And like now the teachers are going to have to <laughs> reverse engineer everything that the parents were, were teaching them and stuff. But That's yeah. right. Yeah. You hear that? Every time your fridge kicks on, oh, yeah. we get a little glitch. Um, so yeah, we're at hour and 45. I think we covered a lot of stuff, yeah. a lot of good stuff. Um, the, my biggest takeaway from this is all of the things that are kind of exasperated in your life and that you may see in a more direct level, I think it's applicable to anyone that has a kid, to tell you the truth. I think your challenges may be more a parent and, and you can identify them perhaps a little easier. But when you listen to how you identify the problem and then the solution that you come up with and how you implement it, I don't think there's a parent alive that couldn't take away some, some positivity from that and put some tools into their tool belt that could assist them in being a better parent as well. I don't think it's applicable to special needs parents only. Right. Well, and not to get super political or societal, on us right now, but um, we're seeing uh, kind of a, the unraveling of a culture happen all around us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, some groups want to deconstruct the family. And I'm in a position where I see the only good change, not, maybe not the only good change, but one of our best opportunities for positive change in our culture is to uh, love our spouses better and better model what that looks like for the next generation lead our kids in a way uh, where they're going to be strong and they're going to be uh, confident and they're going to be well loved and instead of spewing all these things about how you want the world to be different in your opinion versus your neighbor's opinion and all this stuff let's just slow everything down let's love each other better let's model well for the next generation, what uh, strength uh, looks like um, in generation to generation. And, and I think that the stuff we talked about today is applicable to anybody just based on marriage is hard, parenting is hard, um, careers are hard, life is full of trials. Mm -hmm. And we got to work to, to, to be stronger and better through them. And if we, we what we're seeing in society right now is is the lack of work i was just going to say it if you didn't use that word as not it that's exactly what i was going to say what we're seeing is people that don't want to put the work in yeah because just like you said if you don't want to in marriages my marriage has been on the brink more than once that's just part of being married yep but if you get to that point and then you just say you know what i'm walking well what is that going to do you can see what that does because the data is out there and it's proven that raising your families in single parent homes, it has, it has catastrophic effects and not to say that every single parent home is not doing a good job because obviously there's a lot of people out there. They're doing what they can with what they have. Right. But at the same time, giving your kids the most balanced mm -hmm. and, and, offering them like I think it's important for them to have the, the masculine input from their father and the feminine input from their mother 
it's going to give them the best tools to then be successful when they embark on this world on their own. hundred percent. Yeah. And we've actually begun to see what, uh, modeling healthy behavior looks like in our own family. Um, I was sitting at my computer the other day and Macy walks up to me and she goes, dad, I need to work out. <laughs> we, we put together a wad for uh-huh. me. She used that word, like, you know, kind of rob a CrossFit term. It's a parenting win right there. Yeah. And, and I'm like, dropped everything I was doing in that moment and wrote her a, a workout. And, uh, she comes back in the room 25 minutes later, face is beat red. Cause I still had work to do that day. I didn't go and watch, but she, I knew she knew how to do all the exercises. So she comes back to me and she's like, Oh man, I'm going to be sore tomorrow. And I'm like, that kid just got after it, did the whole thing. That's so awesome. And, uh, well, and it's weird to think about that, you know, the amount of emphasis that we put on physical health is it's minimal. I would say as a, as an overall society well, in, a, in a time in your day kind of thing, the time yeah. allotment, it's minimal, but not only just like the, the time allotment, but say like school, like, I think I want to say after, is it after sixth grade that PE becomes an elective? You don't even have to go to PE anymore. Mm. And the number one killer in America is heart disease related to obesity. Right. Like that's the most dangerous part of your future is neglecting your health. The proof is in the pudding. Right. Yet we still don't put a lot of emphasis on people's health, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, kind of touching back on all the kind of major points that we've talked about um, this evening. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a lifestyle. It's a, a, a way you've got to operate your life in a way that's going to be healthy for you for the people that you love and for the next generation. And um, like I said at the beginning, I wouldn't be sitting in this chair talking like I'm talking if it weren't for Max. Mm -hmm. And the amount of times that I've been cussed at and told that, wish that I I was never around, I, I didn't mention the best part of my day, which is every morning when he wakes up, he comes and finds me and gives me the biggest hug, no matter what he said to me the night before. Uh-huh. And uh, I am a better human being. I'm a better husband. I'm a better father because of that kid. And you can look at a special needs kid And if you're tired and you're exhausted and you're run down from all the stress, um, you can begin to, to look at that kid as, as, Oh man, this is just, this is something in my life that I just have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Or you can say, no, that kid is teaching me how to be stronger. I have to fight for it. I have to be stronger. I've got to train I've got to get after it if I want to do well. And he's teaching me how to how to be a better person. And I the list is lengthy. Like how I view people today, I see every human being through a different set of lenses because of Max. Mm-hmm. I'm able to process intense uh, situations better because of Max. I'm in better physical shape because of Max. I'm in better mental shape because of that. Like the list goes on. And um, so circling all the way back, that's why I think that my journey is incredibly fascinating. Being a parent of a special needs kid uh, is a lot of different things. The top of the list for me is it's just fascinating. That's truly incredible. It's pretty awesome. So I think that's a good spot to wrap up. And uh, I think you did a great job at kind of painting that picture for everybody. And it's, it's really interesting to see that the conclusion that you drew from all of this stuff is that it's something that you have utilized to become a better person mm-hmm. and grow from. And we live, in a, we live in a world where it's too easy to get into the, the poor me thing and, and feel like you're a victim. And you stepped out of that and allowed yourself to see like, wow, 
what a blessing in disguise. Yeah. Thanks, man. I love it, man. Yeah. All right. You got anything else to wrap up or? No, thanks for having me on. This has been, this has been really fun. All right. I appreciate it, man. All right. That's going to be a wrap guys.